Revelations chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Greeting to the, se to the seven churches. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness and the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all tribes on earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Thank you, Angelica. There's one word and concept that sticks out in that text that Angelica just read that can really hang people up. And that's what I want to talk about today. One word that has made countless people walk away from the Bible and from the good news that could set them free. But before we get there, let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for this book that we have come to realize is about an unveiling of something about, uh, that you're going to do, an unveiling of Jesus' return to this earth. And God, we would pray that the same spirit that inspired John to write these words would also inform our understanding and help us to uh, apply these things to our own lives. Pray too that, God, that my humanness would just wash away and anything that I say which is untoward, your word would also just fall away. Teach us now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're talking about the book of Revelation. It's a series. I have no idea how long it's going to last. Um, we decided uh, in the first uh, service, a fellow came up to me because I talked about one word last week. I'm going to talk about one word this week. And at this rate, um, he shared with me that there are 4,851 words, I forget what it was, but it turned out that it would take me 189 years to get through the book of Revelation at the rate we are going uh, right now. Um, but be that as it may, it's an important book and these are important concepts and uh, you are going to look forward to, uh, to this book. Last week we began with the first word of this book, and we saw that that book is uh, the unveiling. That is the, the word, remember what the word was? Uh, what? Apo apocalypse. So the very first word in the original language was apocalypsis of Jesus Christ, the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ, from which we get our word apocalypse, which in a lot of people's minds is this cataclysmic event. But what we saw was that word simply means the unveiling, the taking off of the veil. And that, uh, that veil is something that Jesus spoke about in, in Matthew chapter 24. He started to, to lift that veil. And it says this in Matthew 24, As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him all the various temple buildings, and he responded, Do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth. They will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. And later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, and his disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And Jesus told them, don't let anybody mislead you. 
For many will come in my name claiming, I'm the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this, all of this, is only the first of the birth pains with more yet to come. Now let me ask, does that sound like he's describing today? You know, many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah. There are all kinds of uh, institutions where people are claiming that they are, in fact, God or they are Jesus. Uh, you will hear of wars and threats of war. Check. These things must take place. Nation will go to war against nation. Check. Kingdom against kingdom. Check. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. Check. But this is just the beginning. Now I said this isn't about doom and gloom, but Jesus isn't saying that this is the doom and gloom. What he's saying is these are things that are going to happen in the course of, of time leading up. How do you deal with those things? And that's what this unveiling is about. It, it's unveiling a little bit more of, of God's plan so that we don't have to approach this with fear. And one of the things that Jesus said, one of the first things in the book of Revelation in chapter 1, he says, when, when he speaks, is, don't be afraid. And we saw that last week. But then he says this in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. And so a part of this unveiling is uh, helping us to, to, to be able to see what's going on in, the, in our lives and in the life of the world so that, that we can have a better sense. But I said that there's one word in this, in this passage which is really troublesome to a lot of people. And here's the word. Soon. Soon. It's a word that appears not just in what, uh, what we just read, but it appears a total of six times in this book, and it appears throughout the New Testament that the apostles write of this, Jesus spoke of it, but here in, in Revelation, I'll just give you a, a taste of a few things. If you, if you go to the very back of the book, uh, we have that, that phrase brought up in in chapter 22 and verse 7, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming soon. And what we saw last week, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. But again, in, um, in verse 7, he says this, Look, I'm coming soon. Verse 12, he says, Look, I'm coming soon. Verse 20, he says, Yes, I am coming I mean, again and again and again. How many of you have uh, somebody in your life who uh, says, yeah, I'll get around to it? You have someone like that? It's funny, I've uh, developed somewhat of a reputation for this, apparently, uh, because my, my daughter's future in-laws asked her the other day, so... Are those boxes in Debbie and Dennis's dining room still there? And Matt and Katrina looked at one another and said, yeah, they're still there. You see, back in, in, during COVID time, um, everything went wrong with our appliances. And we said, we're just going to replace them all. We thought we were just going to do the kitchen, ended up our, our washer then went on the blink. So I mean, that, that year was a year of, of appliances. And so we put in a washer and a dryer, a dishwasher and, uh, and a stovetop range. And, and this guy who sold us said, oh, and installation is included. Yeah, it's included if you do it yourself. Uh, I mean, 
I was, I was sitting in my office and Debbie calls and she says, uh, the guy's here with the dishwasher, but he said he's not going put to it, put it in. And I'm like, what? And I said, well, how about taking the old one away? No, he said he's not allowed to disconnect the old one. I said, I'll be right there. And so I pull out the dishwasher. It takes about five minutes to undo a dishwasher. And I got the guy to take it away. I said, so can you put, nope, no, sir, I can't, I can't put anything in. So I got the stove range in, I got the dishwasher in, but we have this oven tower. And there are these three units that I'm supposed to put into this thing. And I just haven't wanted to do it. And people ask me, so when, when are you going to get that done? And I said, well, soon. Soon. And I have, I have drawings, I have everything, and I've talked to some of you in this, in this uh, congregation about, uh, about what, what would be the best way to do this? How am I going to get around this problem? Anyway, I like to think that I travel in good company. Because when people ask God, when is all this going to happen? He says, soon. Now, if God can take 2,000 years to fulfill a promise that he's made, uh, you know what? I think we, as fallible human beings, should have a little bit longer. So if you're married or if you have a friend or a significant other who, you know, struggles with this problem, just give them some space and realize they are just depicting Jesus to you. Okay? So, be that as it may. Uh, this word, uh, you, you're all grumbling and one, one person's walking out because of what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> this word... Uh, can, can be taken a couple different ways, but here's, here's what I want to say. This word, as you incorporate it into your thinking, changes everything. And this is not taught enough in the church. It's not been taught enough at this church, and I, there, there are some churches who just totally ignore this whole deal. You see, the word can, can mean soon or, or suddenly. In fact, there is a story that Jesus teaches, and he says, uh, be ready because my coming will be like a thief in... Some of you are familiar with that. And how do thieves in the night come? They don't ring the doorbell at 5 o'clock in the evening and say, hey, I just want you to know I'll be showing up later tonight, you know? But rather, they just come unexpectedly, right? They come suddenly. And when, when, when we start to understand this, we start to develop a mindset. It, it's more about a mindset than it is a chronological measurement. Let, let me explain that one. Okay. So, if, if you know that a, a thief is going to be coming someday or suddenly, what do you do for that? You, you prepare. Maybe some of us are in the habit of locking doors. Maybe you lock a door. Some of you may take more of a defensive mindset. We won't get into that. I understand. I do too. Uh, but you see, we, we, we have a mindset toward that and we prepare for it. Right? And sometimes that, that mindset can become a little bit Annoying. I, I revert back to, to my parents again. You see, because as a time approaches, a, as it gets shorter and shorter, we, we tend to put more and more urgency to it. So last week I, I asked the question, how many of us uh, start to clean our houses when we, when we know that we're going to have guests arrive? Right? We, we do that, right? Now, if you know you're going to have guests arrive um, a month from now, you, you, you don't really start cleaning a month from now, right? You, you wait. You wait. How, how long do you wait? Wait. How long do you wait? How, how long? The, the, the weekend of? Yeah, right, exactly. Weekend of. Um, and so 
here's, here's what, what my, my dad would do. My, my mom would be getting everything straight and, and uh, she, she would work for a couple days the weekend of if, if she was having guests on, on Saturday night. And inevitably, my dad would take out his toolbox 30 to 45 minutes before the guests were arrived and he would start to take apart the faucet in what we called the powder room because it was always dripping. And so my dad would say, I need to replace the washer. And my mom would get so angry, she'd, she'd go storming in and she'd look and say, Norm, I hope you're going to get that thing put together. Do you know what you're doing? Are you, is that going to be put together before our guests thrive? You know somebody likes to get here 10 minutes early. You know, and it was always this, this thing. But you see, as the time got shorter and shorter, my, my, my dad had this mindset of, I need to get that taken care of. And so this idea of, of soon or, or suddenly is, is a powerful mindset which can propel our actions and it, and it, and it, can, it can inform the way that we think about something. Chris Prindeville is back. Um, yay, it's nice to see you. They, he came for his uh, niece's, niece's graduation this weekend from high school. So you're a great uncle, I must say. Uh, but, I mean, Chris is a firefighter, and he's taken five months. They have went out to California, and he's, he's fighting fires. And I, I know that, that you guys adopt this, this mindset, don't you? you? You have a mindset that a brush fire can start soon. And a brush fire starting soon means that it can also start suddenly. Uh, we were up north uh, last spring, and I think I mentioned to you there, there were like 30 uh, people from uh, for, forest rangers and, and the, the firefighting team who were just up north, not because there were any brush fires, but because of the, the imminent possibility of brush fires up north, that they were all there scoping out what do we need to do to prepare in case one breaks out here or here or here? How are we going to get to it? You see, that, that expectation changes the way that you live. And it changes the way that you think. And so that's why we're taking one whole message to talk about this because it's important. I mentioned this last week that, you know, a month ago we talked about uh, the importance of, of communion, uh, this do in remembrance of me, you are what you remember. And last week uh, I, I fell upon th this phrase and I really want to, to keep hitting this over the course of this entire series because you are what you anticipate. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, you are what you anticipate. How many of you remember anticipating a date with your significant other, the first date with your significant other? Remember that? Uh, how many of you remember anticipating a big game? How many of you remember anticipating a review at work or negotiating a big contract? Every one of those anticipations change the way that you were thinking about that moment in time in the future, whether you had a specific moment or not, and it changed your behavior, right? I got to get rid of this zit before I go out on that date. I have to make sure that I have this presentation spot on before I make this, before I, I show up for that meeting, right? And it, it conditions what you, how you think, and it conditions what you do. You are what you anticipate. And so, when, when Scripture says, Behold, I am coming soon. When Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon. This is foundational for who we are. Some of us grew up uh, reciting the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. Remember all of that? Twelve points, and the 11th point regards, I believe in the resurrection of the body. And what's that about? 
It's about what Jesus promised in, uh, through the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of what is going to happen. And he, he describes Jesus' return to earth and the resurrection of, of believers to, to make this triumphal entry into the world. And you see, when, 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 you, when you anticipate that, it changes the way that you think about it. How many of you look forward to a day when God will bring all things to justice? Won't, won't that be great? You look around the world today. How many of you have ever been treated unjustly? Doesn't it, doesn't it just change the way that you think if you realize that God will balance those scales one day? Vengeance is mine, says the, says the Lord. And what does that mean? It means that I don't have to behave in a manner which tries to, to right everything because one day God will. Do you, do you see how this works? Let, let me paint a, um, a bigger illustration. This last week... Um, we, we celebrated the 80th anniversary of D-Day. Have, have, you, have you seen the stories of this in, in the news? Uh, one, one fellow, one of the, the survivors of D-Day who was going there to celebrate actually died en route. Um, this is probably the last D-Day where there will be present people who were at the actual beach in Normandy where D-Day took place. So D-Day... Was this, uh, was this huge, dare I call it an event, this huge battle um, in the course of, of World War II. And let me just read it, make sure I get the, the facts right. On June 6, 1944, Allied troops from the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Australia, and Canada landed on five stretches of German-occupied French coastline. It was the largest amphibious invasion in world history. So amphibious invasion, that is, coming from the water onto the land. The largest one in world history. And what's important is that it laid the foundation for the defeat of Nazi Germany during World War II. See, what happened on D-Day changed the way that the Allied forces looked on it, on themselves. The world and the Allied forces, they didn't know if they were going to be able to, to prevail over the military machine of the Third Reich. But come D-Day and the significance of that victory, it changed their way of thinking. It was a traumatic, powerful event. I was listening to one of the survivors describe coming up on a landing craft and, and ramming it in, in, into the shore and looking at the water with the waves running pink and the water running red. Can you imagine? And it affected not just the coming days and weeks and months, but it, it, it affected this guy's entire life. His grandchildren, his children, his spouse were, were saying how, how he, he would wake up almost every day for the rest of his life screaming because of the images of that. When we remember our veterans, we remember the price that they paid, not just on a particular day, but through their entire lifetimes. But you see, D-Day was pushing toward something. And what was that? It's what we call VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, to be distinguished from v VJ Day. See, we don't, we don't talk about this enough, because these are important things. VJ Day, which was victory in Japan. So VE Day, notice, happened 11 months after D-Day. 
And there were all kinds of battles and skirmishes which, which led up to VE Day. But there was this 11-month period which was brutal. And it was gruesome. It had more than a half a million U.S. casualties alone. U.S. alone. Remember the, all the Allied forces. This is just us in the United States. And of those, more than 100,000 were killed in action. This involves, you've heard of the Battle of the Bulge was during this time. All of these different skirmishes. But what made the difference when they didn't know if they would be able to defeat the military machine called the Third Reich? What made the difference that propelled them to VE Day? They all look back and say it was D-Day. It was that victory on the shores of Normandy and taking that which began to push the Nazis back until they were ultimately contained. And Hitler took his life in defeat and there was surrender. General Eisenhower was responsible for uh, leading through at that time, and the, the press people wanted to have this big story, and General Eisenhower, in his humility, said, no, this is the story. You want to hear the entire story? One sentence. The mission of this Allied force was fulfilled at 02 4,100 hours, May 7th, 1945, period. In other words, mission accomplished at 2.41 in the morning. Now, some of you know the, the power of this. If you've been uh, on a sports team and you've had a victory during the season and now you're coming back and you're playing that that same team in the finals what do you look back on you look back on the previous victory right and that 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 propels you the coach is going to draw back on that and say we've done this before you've got this how does this overlay with Jesus' soon and coming return? Well, think about the cross and the resurrection, the, the, the whole Easter story from, from Monday, Thursday, through, through Resurrection Sunday, through the Last Supper, and through Jesus praying in the garden, and through his, his unlawful arrest and, and trial and ultimate crucifixion on the cross and his his saying that on, on the cross it is finished it is paid in full the guilt the shame that that you've carried i am paying i am paying for that in full now father into my hands i commit my spirit and all of that being validated on on easter sunday this this is the d-day And then in Scripture, we have this reference to that day, or the day of the Lord, or the final day. And that is referring to the, the future return of Jesus Christ in glory. I so remember I was standing in the Ludolf's backyard the year that this church, the summer that this church started, and we began... Um, I, I teach through uh, the book of Acts that summer. I re-preached through the book of Acts not too long later, and it took me two years. Um, but uh, I, I, I remember uh, right where I was standing and the look on people's faces when, when I, I quoted Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, where the angel 
has come to Jesus' followers. They have just watched him ascend into heaven following his 40 days uh, on earth after his resurrection and his appearing to more than 500 people during that time and showing that he was not a ghost. He was not an imagination. He was not a mass hallucination, but that he really and truly did, in fact, rise from the dead God the Father and through the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. And here they are. They're, they're watching him now uh, uh, rise into the clouds. And this angel appears and says, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. And you see, this, this expectation, this anticipation is every bit as important to how we live our lives as Christ followers as is Easter Sunday. In fact, I dare say it's more important on how we live our lives. Because the, the, the remembrance is one thing, but the anticipation colors everything that we do. And so theologians will refer to the cross uh, as the initiation of the kingdom. It's the already. And that day in the future, anticipating when, when Christ returns, is the not yet. And we live in this thing called the kingdom of God, which is already and not yet. It's been started, but it's not yet completed. And when, when is that going to happen? It's going to happen yeah, soon. Peter will come to say in answering people's objections to this that the doubters, well, with the Lord, as with some of your husbands, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. You know, one of those ovens going to get installed soon. Soon. When is Jesus going to return? He's going to return soon. But know this. It will happen. And it will happen suddenly. And so the everyday life in the emerging kingdom of God is, is, is shaped or should be. It should be shaped by this expectation. And, you know, if, if you're going through your, your life as a Christ follower and things have become kind of stale, what we, what we need to do is remind ourselves, Jesus is coming again. I grew up in a, a church, and one of my favorite memories is on Sunday evenings when we would gather together, uh, there, 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 were, there were certain songs that, that would be sung, and one of them was the song, Coming Again. And should I sing it, or you want to just hear the words? Uh, you want me to sing it? Coming again, coming. Do you know this song? Coming again, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, or someday soon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a glorious day it will be. Jesus is coming again. <coughs> You, everyone's saying, why did you prompt him to do that? <clears throat> but, you see, I, I, I realized how foundational that song and that understanding was. That this is not a day to be feared. It's going to be a great thing. I can't wait. I can't wait, and I hope it happens in my lifetime. Wouldn't it be cool? I had a book, uh, I had a study book on the book of Revelation, and on the front it had a, a picture of clouds and, uh, and hills, and it was just this beautiful scene, and every time that scene uh, appears around here, uh, as I'm driving down Highway 78 through, through the bluffs going toward Portage, I, I look at that, and for some reason, it just invokes in my mind, ah, one day Jesus is going to come again. Now, for some people, I keep on referring to my parents. I don't know what this is about, but I, I've shared this before. It instilled fear in my mother. I had to work on this with my mom as I came to greater understanding. But her, her thing was, she, she heard this as a child, and she thought she was going to be caught on the toilet 
uh, when Jesus returned. And that, that, that caused her certain digestive problems. And, 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 you know, it's like, Mom, it's okay. Jesus understands, you know. And she, she would ask me, do you, do you think I'm going to have to go to the bathroom? When I'm, and I'm, now you have to understand, my mom was a quadriplegic and I had to lift her up and I'd place her on the toilet. And I, I had to basically emulate a, a squatty potty for, for my mom to help move her bowels. And, and she was so embarrassed to, to do this in front of me. And I said, Mom, you know what? You've discovered that you can do this in front of me. And Jesus made you. He doesn't care, Mom. It's okay. And whatever your fear might be about Jesus, soon return. You know what? It's okay. Jesus said, don't be afraid. It's a great thing and it shapes everything that we do. It's about everyday life in the emerging kingdom of God. But I have to say that, that it's not just about everyday life. It's about everyday life and death and trials in the emerging kingdom of God. Because as you, as you have this, this soon coming return of Jesus, shaping your mindset and shaping the way that, that you view the world and your circumstances, it changes everything. Maybe you saw a news story regarding this couple. Aren't they cute? They were martyred for Jesus the Thursday before our Memorial Day. I wanted to mention it on Memorial Day, but I didn't want to take away from those who have given their lives in service to our country. But these two and a colleague, um, Natalie is 21, Davy I believe is 24, and Jude Montes, I believe was uh, in his mid-40s. And they had just come from a, uh, from a youth meeting. Her parents started a mission in, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And she grew up loving on these kids. And she wanted to give her life to this ministry just as her parents did. But as you may have heard, uh, Haiti is uh, being ruled by, by small tribal gangs right now. There is no, uh, no, no more official government. And it is, it's a mess. But you see, the soon and coming return of Jesus is what made them want to stay. The State Department doesn't want you to be there right now. But the soon and coming return of Jesus colors that advisory. Now, I don't hear that call. I choose to live my ministry in this small, idyllic community. I love this place. I had a friend who came and did an intervention with me. He said, Dennis, this is an intervention. He and his wife came. We were sitting at the then Blue Spoon, may she rest in peace. And, and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm living out my ministry here in this beautiful, idyllic small town. He said, well, we want you in Charleston, North Carolina. South Carolina. Nor anyway, he was from North Carolina. I forget what town it was. Um, and he, uh, I'm like, no, dude, this is, Jesus is coming. That's what, that's what shapes who we are and, and, and what we're doing. And God's called me here, and it's okay. I don't have to be a part of your big thing. I love this thing. And these kids realized that they were living in a dangerous situation. And that dangerous situation isn't what colored what they were doing. What colored what they were doing was the soon return of Jesus and knowing that these kids and these families they, they, they need to know that the love of God and the community of the Holy Spirit and of the church. And I believe it was Jude who was attacked with the butt of a gun and they uh, sought refuge in a house which became shot up and the three of them were executed by gang members who were neighborhood gang members who knew what these people represented. And they killed them anyway. And then two gangs fought for all of their possessions and ransacked the church. But you see, 
it's, it's the cross which has ripple effects into our lives, propelling us, not, not just ripple effects, but dude, it's, like, it's like surfing waves. You, you, you can surf the wave all the way to the not yet day of Christ's return, which propels you through all of the trials and the death and, and whatever might uh, happen in this life, but just everyday life. It gives you that focus. Now think about it. Think about how that affects your relationships. If, if things are out of sort in, in, your, in your life covenant relationship and you're just not happy right now, the anticipation of Christ's return can color that whole thing. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus paints a picture, and, and, and he paints a picture of, of, of a day when all things will be made right. And he tells people, you know, enter into my kingdom, and they say, well, we're, we're not worthy. And, and he says, oh, yes, y- yes, you are. Because you visited me when I was in prison, and you fed me when I was hungry, and when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And they, they said, when did we do that? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, my people, you did it. And when, 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 we, when we love, even when things aren't going the, quite the way we might want them to go, we're anticipating that day when Jesus says, well done, well done. When, 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 we, when we give up on having to have vengeance and retribution towards someone who has done something wrong for, uh, to, to us, because we, we understand that one day Jesus will set all things right, the anticipation of that day colors our behavior, and we don't have to. We don't have to seek vengeance on our own. Vengeance is, says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You don't have to do that. Do you, do you see how, how this can work? When, when, when you look at, at what you're doing with the rest of your life, this is the first day of the rest of your life, What's going to shape that? Is it going to be late night TV? Is it going to be whatever your favorite newspaper is? Or is it going to be what God's plan is for the arc of human history? Defined by the cross on one side and Jesus' return on the other. See, that's the power of this word, soon. Jesus is coming again and he's coming And I don't know how long that is. And Jesus didn't know how long that that was either. But this unveiling is unveiling that we can have hope through this whole thing. And so I close with this. Prepare. As you follow Jesus, wherever he leads, that you too will suffer. I mean, there there are going to be times. Okay? And our, our our American mindset of comfort... It's the greatest idol that we face in our lives. It really is. Everything is about our comfort. That ultimately, we will share in the victory that was Jesus at the cross, at the resurrection, and in his soon return. Allow it. Allow it to shape the way you think about the world, about history, about your life. Lord God, we give your Holy Spirit permission to to bring these thoughts and ideas and passages of Scripture back to us in the coming days and weeks and months. And God, when when, when we think about the soon return of Christ. 
let that God to shape our, our perspective. And God, when someone gives us a hard time, you believe that stuff? Say, well, you know, it's not quite what you might think it means. But here's what it looks like. God, we pray that you would be present in those conversations. God, come quickly. Let us be the church. Amen. There was a way that believers greeted one another back in the day, and it was with the word Maranatha. Maybe you've heard of that. And it simply means, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Have a great week. Thanks for your attention to God's word. Questions, please shoot them my way. Uh, Love to talk more about this book. Well, we will. We will.